I am Murat Çelikkan. I am the co-director of Hafıza Merkezi. Uh, as Hafıza Merkezi, we're organizing a series of panel discussions to have a comparative approach to the rising authoritarianism and the struggle against it. The panels are organized by a joint project of Hafıza Merkezi with the Association for Monitoring Equal Rights, Turkey, and Dutch Helsinki. As you might be well aware of, civil society is currently under a threat in many parts of the world. The 21st century introduced many nations abandoning human rights, institutions and standards, which they previously supported. This era has been identified as the shrinking civil or democratic space. Making the situation worse, the emer emergence of COVID-19 as a global pandemic created new risks and challenges for rights-based work as a whole. We are holding a series of online panels where we get the chance to discuss human rights work comparatively under COVID-19 conditions, particularly within the framework of uh, shrinking civil space. We wanted to start from a conceptual base to take a picture of activism under shrinking civil space in the first panel. This session will present an overview of the issues and concepts surrounding the notion of shrinking civil space, its evolving new shapes, particularly in the context of the pandemic, as well as a discussion on the new tactics currently being employed as a response. Our second panel will be on the 5th of November. It will be about digital rights. And Nikat Dad from Pakistan and Kerem Altaparmak from Turkey will participate on that second panel. Maybe this attempt of discussing shrinking space or rising authoritarianism in a series of comparative discussions online can also be named as citizen diplomacy. The name further for it is the Venezuelan NGO Provia. This example comes from the wonderful book about shrinking civil space, rising to the populist challenge by Cesar Rodriguez Garavito and Krisna Gomez. I'm very happy to introduce Mr. Cesar Rodriguez Garavito, who is the co-director, Center for Human Rights and Global Justice, New York University School of Law, and editor-in-chief of Opal Global Rights. He is also the founder of Just Labs. He has been a visiting professor at New York University, Stanford University, Brown University, the University of Melbourne, Pretoria in South Africa, and the European Uni University Institute, and the American University in Cairo. It's not our first collaboration with CZAD, and I'm very happy that we keep coming together. The name of the first panel is Reopening Civic Spaces for Civil Society in Times of COVID-19. Shrinking civil spaces may be the most popular uh, concept of uh, civil rights organizations all around the world recently. And Cesar, I would like to address my first question you, to, to you, saying that your book, in your book, you state that the proliferation of populist governments and movements creates serious risks and challenges for human rights around the world, from India to Venezuela, from the United States to Turkey, from Hungary to Russia, and from the Philippines to Poland. What is this concept of shrinking civil space and what are the common characteristics of it? Thank you, Murat. Uh, let me begin by saying that it is indeed uh, an honor for me to be in this event. 
and share this space with Murad and Happy Summer Casey and the Dutch Helsinki Committee, who are all uh, at the front lines of both the analysis and the struggle against illiberal democracies and against shrinking civil society spaces. It is because of these uh, organizations and many others in countries like the ones that Murad nicely mentioned that uh, human rights continue to be um, thriving, uh, at least as a promise for human dignity around the world. And I'm honored to be here with you all. In terms of the concept, I would, I would uh, start by saying that the most challenging aspect of the current wave of uh, restrictions against the uh, civil society, including um, NGOs who work with, that work for human rights, independent media outlets, and so on, academic institutions, and so on, is that it's coming most of the time from governments that who were initially elected through democratic processes. So this is not; these are not the authoritarians of the late 20th century. Right? The human rights movement uh, originated in my own corner of the world in Latin America in opposition to dictatorships, so military dictatorships that uh, arose in the 1970s uh, and that met with the resistance of, say, the relatives of the quote-unquote disappeared uh, by the uh, Southern Cones uh, military uh, uh, juntas in Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, and so on. As horrible as those human rights violations were and as authoritarian as those governments were, the game plan was relatively clear for human rights organizations. These were unelected governments that could be uh, delegitimized internationally precisely because they had not came, come to power through democratic elections. Now, that playbook, and this is the term that we use in the book, that playbook of human rights activists that got more and more sophisticated, more impactful over the last 50 years, uh, finds real obstacles and gets into trouble when it comes to facing off against leaders in countries uh, uh, around the world who came to office through democratic means only to then go, uh, go on to dismantle democratic guarantees. And, and this is where the new playbook of authoritarian elected government governments come in because they tend to be quite adept at using the law to do away with democratic law and one uh, perfect example is hungary victor orban for over a decade has very patiently chipped away at the institutions of democratic governance back in the 1990s the Hungarian Constitutional Court was a model, actually was quoted as a, as a, as a particularly um, independent, sophisticated, innovative uh, in, in, in constitutional court. Now, well, he packed the court, then went on to use the electoral laws to make sure that the rules were changed uh, to persecute their opponents to the point that even uh, that today Hungary, even by you know, mainstream standards like think tanks who lean to the conservative side of politics, today have declared that Hungary is no longer a democracy. And likewise, one can go one country after another. Of course, there are perfect examples in, in Turkey, in, uh, in uh, more recently in India, Venezuela, and this is another trait. This cuts across the national political divisions. So it's not an issue, it's not a, a threat or a challenge coming only from right-wing governments or from left-wing governments. But look at what happens, for example, in Venezuela. It's a country that has gone a particularly painful period where Provea, the organization that Borat Kori has done a tremendously uh, courageous um, job at defending what's left of democratic institutions there, if anything. And it, so, the challenge to sum up is particularly difficult and, and, and has 
uh, led to innovations on the part of human rights organizations and civil society organizations, media outlets, religious organizations, independent um, collectives of youth, and so on, because the tools of yesterday, for example, trying to shame, you know, the activists and scholars used to call uh, the main the main strategy of the human rights movement naming and shaming, meaning denouncing authoritarian leaders before uh, the UN institutions or European or North American governments and hoping that those governments and those institutions put, would put pressure on those authoritarian leaders to do the right thing and protect human rights. Well, as we know, they're not getting receptive uh, uh, ears in, in Washington or even the EU. Uh, and this calls for a different set of approaches, which in the book that uh, Murat uh, mentioned, uh, we proposed by way of a, of a new playbook for human rights uh, activists uh, around the world. Okay. Uh, before, I, I would directly ask about the new way of activism against this shrinking civil space, but before that, let me just check out that there are claims that it's not shrinking space, but it's being reshaped on the one hand. One, one uh, claim is that, and the other is, uh, as uh, to give an example, Catherine Second puts out, in fact, uh, the human rights situation in the world is not deteriorating, but in, in a global sense, uh, it's improving when you look at the data of environmental uh, movements and women's uh, movements. You also mentioned the tension between democracy and human rights because of the elected leaders. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that too? Thank you, Cesar. Sure. So on the first part of the question, I agree with Catherine Sicking that this is not the end times of human rights. There are some skeptical scholars, uh, mostly in the US and in some parts of Europe, that have concluded that because of the challenge of authoritarian uh, leaders, like the ones that we've been talking about today, and because of also the twin challenges of other, uh, other sources of human rights abuses that I understand you will be talking about in this series soon, for example, the dominance of digital platforms and uh, uh, around the world and the fact that they're, they're being used to polarize, for them polarize, polarize uh, the national polities and, and turn people into tribe members that are further, further apart. Uh, because of all of that, some scholars uh, have concluded that these are the end times of human rights, that, in, uh, that human rights had a good run, but that was project for the 20th century. And now in the 21st century, uh, they've gone into a period of terminal crisis and we need to come up with a different project. I do not agree with those criticisms while accepting, and I've written, I've tried to uh, strike kind of an intermediate tone in this discussion. I think that while they are not right, that this is a terminal crisis of human rights, I also think that human rights will not continue to be impactful, useful, if new tactics are not attempted, if the whole toolbox of human rights activism is not uh, rethought, because again, populist authoritarian leaders are very happy to be named, but are shameless, right? So naming and shaming doesn't work as it used to, because they, they, they're they very happy all these authoritarian types of usually a man with huge egos and uh, immensely narcissistic tendencies, they cannot have enough uh, of themselves. And uh, of, of, of so they're happy to be named, but they are shameless. So naming and shaming just won't do it. Now, that doesn't mean that human rights have not made incredible uh, contributions to the protection and improvement of uh, protection of human dignity around the world. And Catherine Seeking in that book and in a wonderful book uh, entitled um, Evidence for Hope shows empirical data about how, for instance, women's rights or, or uh, um, civil and political rights around the world 
had improved relative to say the 1970s. Now, what uh, we need to focus on, and this is my own take on, on these issues, is that we need to acknowledge the progress that has been made, but we cannot basically sit idle and think that those tools that got us there will be enough to sustain that progress, let alone to make additional progress. And this is where the, uh, the knowing the, the, the target governments, knowing how they operate and knowing their nature is important. So I close my answer by tackling the second part of, of the question that Murat raised, which is what's well, something that's particularly challenging uh, with regards to these illiberal democratic governments. That's uh, There are many ways to call these governments and different authors have different ways of calling them. For instance, uh, Viktor Orban himself uh, once said that he wanted to build an illiberal democratic government in uh, in Hungary. Some other people call them populist authoritarianism. So, so we won't get bogged down into the terminological discussion. But there are two characteristics that I think all of these governments, left and right, share. One is strong anti-elitism, and this is why some of them are called populist, but that's a misleading characterization if not qualified with other terms. Um, so, but the crucial aspect is that the trick that many of these governments pull is that they are oftentimes led by the elites, the elites themselves. So look at what happens, for instance, in, in India these days, which is the most recent and painful example of the succession of measures that have been tried elsewhere, uh, policies, uh, judicial persecutions, sending uh, prominent activists to jail, and I cannot, I don't have to explain how painful this is to this audience. Uh, and this is happening as we speak in India. And no one is looking at what's going on there because we're all distracted, of course, with the pandemic and with what's going on in the US and so on. But India, the largest democracy in the world, is adopting the last pieces that was missing from that playbook. A couple of weeks ago, the Modi government uh, adopted a even more uh, restrictive legislation about foreign funding for independent civil society organizations. It's already co-opted all the media. It, will, it has, as uh, you may know, Go, viciously gone against a, a minority of the population, a huge minority in terms of numbers, which is the Muslim population. All of that with the discourse of working for the working class and, 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 and going against the elites. Well, it's the elites actually who are trampling the rights of, uh, on the rights of, of the minorities uh, here. And likewise, and I'm sure that just the description, the brief Precursor description that I just made will resonate with many in this audience because you will have recognized that your own countries have gone ex uh, through exactly the same path of restrictions and, and unconstitutional measures and, and, uh, and measures against um, civic freedoms. Now, the second and final trait, so we have anti-elitism. So if you see, for example, even uh, President Trump, although he's come, he comes clearly from an elite background, he always uh, puts his own fights in terms of fighting against, even today, Washington, as if he were not at the core of Washington, not, not running Washington. But likewise, second, second uh, uh, trait is anti pluralism which is to be kind of the defining the crucial uh, characteristic. Because you can be anti-elitist and be democratic and pluralist. And this is what's characterized, for instance, progressive politics in many in many countries throughout the years, right? So the labor movement, the um, the women's rights movement, so they, they maybe the racial justice movement. It's all against people or denouncing those sectors of society that have dominated a, a, a country or a state forever. Now, but they are not necessarily anti-pluralist. They can coexist with other sectors of society, with other movements. Authoritarian leaders 
of the 21st century are highly anti-pluralist, meaning that they see themselves and they call themselves a very personalistic type of leadership, that they call themselves the representatives of the real people, while everyone else is, uh, is working on behalf of foreigners, is uh, part of the, uh, uh, the uh, an intolerant religious group, and so on, or an ethnically um, stigmatized group like in the Roma, in Hungary, and so on. So it's this radical intolerance against anyone by themselves, but themselves and the groups that they favor, be them religious groups, uh, political groups, economic groups, that define the restrictions and the politics of uh, 21st century autocrats as uh, Provea, the Venezuela organizations has also called them. Okay, I managed to turn on my voice. Um, of course, I can have a lot of questions about uh, those common features of the authoritarian or regimes or uh, illiberal uh, democracies or regimes, but I would, before we go uh, to the impact of COVID, uh, on this illiberal world, I would also like to ask you about uh, what sort of new tactics can we, can the uh, civil movement have uh, against this anti-elitist, anti-pluralist, uh, uh, illiberal, uh, authoritarian uh, regimes uh, in general? It's a key question and one that um, I try to work on with a number of uh, colleagues in different parts of the world. Uh, there is, by the way, a recent series in the portal that I have the privilege of directing. Uh, the portal, the web portal is called Open Global Rights, openglobalrights.org, in which uh, scholars and practitioners from different parts of the world uh, have continued to write about their own initiatives to push back against these types of, of governments. I'll mention some quickly and you'll find case studies and opinion pieces there. One is the realization that there needs to be a combination of institutional uh, action and direct action. Human rights organizations around the world, but and certainly in spaces that are shrinking, like in India again, or Turkey, or, or the other countries that we discussed today, for good reasons have been very sophisticated at and invested a lot of resources and knowledge into doing litigation, into um, proposing new laws, into intervening in the public debate to protect rule of law institutions and mechanisms. So that's more institution-oriented, institution-based uh, work. We have been less energetic uh, and less used to connecting with grassroots mobilization and, and even disorderly uh, direct action types of, of um, strategies like uh, street protests, rallies, uh, boycott, international actions of, that are crowdsourced uh, very quickly. Actions put together by non-professionals, all the way from ar uh, uh, artist collectives to young people like the, uh, like the organizations and the collectives mobilizing against uh, climate inaction uh, around the world. That has started to change and I'm very encouraged by that, develop, by that development. Again, uh, in Venezuela, despite all the difficulties, organizations at some junctures during the long struggle against the, the authoritarian government there have come together with young people protesting on the streets to try to combine what some people call, some authors call, collective action, which is the institution-based, institutionally-oriented type of action on the one hand and 
connected with that double N action, connective action, which is the, the more decentralized uh, online type of mobilization that youth collectives and, and flash mobs and other forms of 21st century mobilization are, are, are uh, able to uh, pull off. Then second, and there's a lot more, but there are some tactics that authoritarian leaders are uh, quite vulnerable to. One is disruptive narratives. So one thing, one front in which they have been quite effective is reframing the national conversation, right? So from say a conversation about economic injustice in our countries and everywhere these days, almost everywhere uh, is witnessing this rising levels of inequality, even before COVID, but certainly uh, during the pandemic. But they've been, been uh, those leaders have been able to reframe that conversation and put the national debate in terms of us versus them, right? The, the Hindu versus the Muslim, the Muslim versus the secular, the, the, uh, uh, the urban populations versus the rural populations, the, the, the citizens versus the uh, foreigners, and so on. And they have succeeded to a large extent in polarizing uh, society. So what many organizations are doing very successfully is pushing back against those, against those narratives through narratives that strengthen connections, that highlight community, that find common ground, that even are are unpredictable. Some of them, for example, use humor. Humor because there's nothing that uh, an authoritarian hates more than humor. They don't have sense of humor, right? So, because humor makes people look vulnerable and these leaders are strong men and they, their whole facade depends on them looking powerful and invulnerable. And what humor does is crack that facade. And for example, there's an excellent organization in Europe called Operation Libero that has successfully uh, led campaigns against xenophobic new legislation against foreigners. And they've done that based on new narratives that redefine what it means to be Swiss or German or French in terms of inclusiveness and in terms and, and using colorful messages uh, and even uh, funny uh, narratives that have been quite effective at pushing back against those discourses. Since we're talking about uh, an international uh, illiberalism of these leaders, do you think that for civil society actors and other actors, Solidarity, national and international solidarity is important also for going against these regimes. That's crucial. I, I couldn't agree more. And some of that is already happening. Of course, some key organizations uh, done a fantastic job from you know, the frontline defenders to the Helsinki committees to many organizations that have a long tradition of international solidarity. So that, that is crucial. Emergency relocation and all that has had a, an important place in, in over the last few years for sad reasons, because people have had to leave their countries or have needed support in staying in their own countries by staying um, you know, free from uh, pressure or persecution. Now, I am particularly encouraged by the fact that there seems to be more cross-learning uh, across regions and countries that where exchanges didn't used to be that frequent or common, right? For example, I see more interest these days, for example, in Turkey about what's going on in India or in Brazil, which is a country that we haven't talked about, but that I um, care deeply about it, worked in Brazil for a number of years now. I have very dear friends and, and colleagues and Brazil is going through hell, literally through a situation of, of, uh, of 
extreme authoritarianism combined with uh, a, a wholesale onslaught against the essential ecosystems like the Amazon. So when Brazilian colleagues uh, and Brazilian scholars and, and activists look around the world, I see that these days they're looking and connecting more often with organizations like Happy uh, Samirkesi or the National Foundation for India and similar organizations that in contexts that are going through similar uh, situations. I do think that those seeds of exchanges of solidarity will continue to um, grow and that because authoritarian democracy will not be there forever, that those will be the seeds of a counter movement uh, and a counter manual against these regimes. Okay, thank you. As if uh, it was not enough to have the rise of uh, popularism and authoritarianism in general, we had uh, the global pandemic. Uh, do you think that uh, it has also an impact, the fight against the pandemic has also an impact on the shrinking civil space? Yes, I think it does have an impact. It's not a predictable impact because the record is mixed. So some authoritarian leaders and governments have done better than others, whereas others are, have done a disastrous job. So from Belarus to uh, Brazil. Now, what these situations have in common, and this we know from uh, historical sociology, is that in situations like the one we're going through, basically the largest uh, economic depression after the Great Depression of the 1920s and 30s, that new ideas and, and new institutions and new discourses have a better chance of sticking under these circumstances because the old consensus is disrupted. So it's, if these leaders seemed so resilient uh, and almost indestructible before the pandemic, well, they now seem less so. But it's not a given that without civil society mobilization, without international solidarity, the outcome will be what one would hope for in terms of the renewal and revitalization of democracy and human rights. But I, I certainly think just as it is a huge challenge for everyone around the world, especially for those living under these types of regimes, it is also an opportunity and, and the opportunities for disrupting and um, hopefully shaking the, the ground uh, uh, on which these regimes have stood for a number of years now, that that will be also an opportunity that will be seized by the human rights movement and by independent civil society organizations. One of the main common features of these regimes is, let me say, arbitrariness. You can't be sure about the future, uh, what's going to happen, how will it happen, when will it happen. But uh, the fight against such a pandemic needs more precise policies. And is there a tension between the autocratic regimes and the fight uh, against COVID, and is there hope that this pandemic might uh, bring some political changes uh, in the world? I think so. It is true that, that uh, these types of governments are highly arbitrary, highly personalistic, so they survive thanks to clientelism, uh, because they need to cater to a certain clientele, to a certain sector of society that they define arbitrarily as the real citizens, to the exclusion of everyone else. Now, clientelistic networks are not exactly skillful or prepared to deal with systemic threats like a pandemic, because in order to deal with a systemic threat, uh, like, uh, like the coronavirus, you need a competent bureaucracy. 
And if you populated that, that bureaucracy with uh, friends, with sectors of society that uh, you want to do political favors to, well, that's, that, that's why in political sociology, there's such a thing as a, as a, the, as a clientelistic state, meaning one that's made up of patchwork, or a patchwork of cliques, of circles of insiders that are in the exact opposite to a competent bureaucracy that can, for example, safely distribute a vaccine uh, or that can safely roll out a massive testing uh, system. And this is why many of these governments have had to double down on repressive measures because they're completely incompetent in dealing with the daily suffering of the populations that they're supposed to serve. Has, uh, I mean, the measures, we know that uh, the measures against the pandemic are taken and kept consistent uh, even uh, to repress uh, the focal uh, uh, groups uh, in a society. Do you think that there, uh, the fight against uh, the epidemic and the times we are in created new forms of solidarity and resistance for the civil space to enlarge? I think so. And this is something that's very encouraging. I think that we're living through a moment that's a combination of the 1930s and the 1960s, uh, at which were the two key turning points in terms of international and national institutions uh, in many, in many contexts. So out of the 1930s, got the welfare state in many countries, or at least a, a developmentalist state in other countries like a, a Turkey, and depending on the level of development, depending on the historical trajectory, the outcome would be different, but definitely turning points. And at the level of the international governance structure, that was the time when the IMF, the World Bank, the UN, and, every, and, and all the ma other major institutions that we know of uh, were established. And then the 1970s, with the economic crisis of the 19, early 1970s, was the turning point, point in the opposite direction. And the pendulum swung in the opposite direction, and then uh, neoliberalism became the dominant framework. I think that, well, it's been widely documented that, neoliber that neoliberalism was already uh, on shaky ground around the world, uh, inequality had been increasing and all out programs of privatization, like the ones that were conducted in some of the countries that we know well, well, ended up not delivering. And what happened is what uh, could have been anticipated, which is that uh, that level of investment on, on, on a large, uh, luxurious infrastructure projects uh, that that debt would be recouped at some point by lenders and, and that uh, governments would go and countries would go into serious economic trouble. But that was even before the pandemic. Now with the pandemic, those stress points have become more acute. And what's encouraging, despite all the suffering, despite and no one wants a, a pandemic, no one would want this situation to, to be the dominant mode of living the, anywhere in the world. But now that we're, we're going through a global uh, crisis, there are also opportunities at creating links among movements and among for forms of organization that would have been that would have been very difficult just a year ago. Let me give you a specific example. Just a year ago, there was a divide between the labor movement and the climate action movement in many countries because, say, workers in the extractive industries in oil and, and coal would oppose climate action on the, on the grounds that they would be, that would mean the end of, to their jobs. Well, now those two movements are coming together because the economic crisis has put, um, has made very visible that oil and gas and, and those extractive industries 
were not viable in the first place and that they would be around for uh, a few more years or decades if the corporations that benefit from those industries uh, continue to lobby uh, parliaments and governments to try to buy time. But now it's clear that a type of Green New Deal is necessary across the board and in countries around the world. That recovery means not only investing in creation of jobs and, and the basic income for um, the population at large, but also in programs that create those incentives while making sure that we make the transition to clean energy. Because if the airlines go back to burning that amount of fossil fuels, if countries after another uh, continue to build new luxurious uh, airports uh, and, and runways, well, there won't be planet to redistribute or to burn off those uh, fossil fuels or to travel to uh, in 2030. As a, I, the IPCC, the Intergovern Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, has repeatedly said. So I am hopeful that the crisis will create an impetus for those movements to integrate with each other more fully and more effectively, because this is a challenge uh, that's put in evidence everything that was wrong about the quote-unquote normal situation that we were living before the pandemic. This will be my last question and then I will open the floor to questions. Um, the inequalities uh, created by neoliberalism uh, was there before but we know that the pandemic also uh, moves in uh, class boundaries. I, I mean, people not, are not affected equally by the pandemic. The weakest uh, is affected the most everywhere uh, in the world. And there is also criticism that up till now, the liberal democracies and the human rights movement uh, could not be enough uh, to end those inequalities in the world which also are increasing uh, by the pandemic. Do you think that uh, the human rights movement will get out of this crisis and liberal democracies will get out of this crisis because the system which creates the inequalities are still there? Will this epidemic be enough to create a new system uh, so that uh, the human rights, respect to human rights and human dignity can prevail. I think and I hope that a different form of democracy will emerge from this crisis, that instead of the illiberal democracy of the regimes that we've been discussing today, we will have a deeper democracy, one that uh, gives more space for citizen participation, but free and frequent citizen participation, not just in elections, not just in moments in which um, uh, governments can trick the rules of the game and use the electoral rules of the game to re-elect themselves, which is what many democracies have um, come to be. But uh, mechanisms like citizen assemblies, which I think is a very promising development. Citizen assemblies have been called in places like Ireland more recently in France to discuss key complex policy issues like what to do about climate change. So that, that more mobilized version of democracy, coupled with the protection of human rights and the renewal of the human rights toolbox, so that we human rights researchers and activists um, create more frequent and deeper alliances and form of solidarity with other forms of progressive and, and inclusive politics, all the way from the racial justice movement to the indigenous movement, to the women's movement, to climate action movement and so on, that that convergence uh, through 
mobilization on the streets and also through institutional action will hopefully move the needle, needle in the direction of structural reforms that are crucial, that are needed for those inequalities not to continue to grow. So as you said, Murad, before the pandemic, we were heading in the wrong direction in countries, both in the global south and the global north. And in most countries, if not all of the countries uh, that are led by these authoritarian leaders, inequality had uh, increased dramatically. Uh, many of them came to power promising or framing or branding themselves as economic saviors as the ones who would go give stability to the economies only to uh, fail spectacularly at offering an actual uh, and actually securing prosperity for the population now we know that because this is what the pandemic has made so evident and so painfully evident that basic structures of markets even markets not just the redistribution but markets and social protection were so weak that they, there was no way for them to respond uh, to the situation of the pandemic. So institutions like and, 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 and institutional configurations like basic income, uh, public health care systems, some uh, sort of uh, uh, workers training programs, some form of more aggressive tax redistribution. All of those seemed radical just a year ago. Now they seem essential because otherwise we now see how exposed uh, we all are, but definitely uh, how the most vulnerable sectors of the population are to any disruption in uh, markets or the economy in general. Well, thank you very much because you, with your approach, uh, you not only keep up hope, which is an essential thing for all the people in the world for uh, struggling for human rights and democracy, but you also uh, show us uh, the new ways uh, to keep that hope uh, to have an impact uh, for the better. So now I'm opening the floor to questions. I'll be receiving them uh, writ in written form and uh, ask uh, that we already have one. And it's about uh, the international humanitarian law. Can that international mechanism be binding for uh, the authoritarian uh, or autocratic leaders? Uh, in the world, uh, is it possible? Uh, is it a, not a risk uh, stepping down from the position with the fear that they can be prosecuted by international humanitarian law? Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the short answer is yes. They are bound by international humanitarian law. There are all kinds of legal tools, rules, and traditions that would show that even if the country has not uh, ratified, say, the treaties, the Rome, the, the Rome Statute, and the, all the international architecture, that uh, some of those um, actions that they have perpetrated go against basic rules of customary law and constitute um, crimes against humanity. So they're are a couple of, for example, relatively recent efforts to hold uh, both Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela and Jair Bolsonaro, extreme opposites in terms of ideology, but very close in terms of anti-democratic politics and persecution of civil society, um, accountable for human rights, for crimes against humanity. So yes, the short legal answer is definitely yes. But the geopolitical answer is that, of course, with the, the world being in the state that it is, even before the pandemic, with very few champions of international human rights being willing to step up at the level of the UN Council, at the level of the, of the defense of, of, of the ICC, International Criminal Court, uh, 
the international political support that human rights institutions and humanitarian law have always depended on uh, has become a lot more precarious. So there needs to be, we certainly are not in the 1990s anymore in those in those terms this is not a moment of the expansion of the rules of international law which doesn't mean that it's a moment of crisis but it also means that we need to invest in political action not in partisan action but political action in terms of contesting the narratives contesting the the the, the strategies uh, that those governments have very effectively put into place like, uh, for instance, uh, the new legislation in India against the Muslim population that has been powerfully and courageously opposed by students who are now being persecuted uh, for having gone to the streets, protest uh, against those measures in early 2020, early this year. And only through that political mobilization, coupled with the tools that we know how to use, which is you know, mobilize the, the courts, use the law, invoke international standards, will it be able, will it be possible to hopefully uh, go back to a time in which those standards will be seen as uh, the international consensus that uh, most, if you know, not all governments will abide by. We have mentioned uh, Privea from Venezuela as uh, taking new measures against this closing civil space. Uh, do you have other examples so that the listening, the audience can look up uh, for the activities of those organizations in mind? Yes. So again, for those of you interested in looking at very specific examples of creative responses. My recommendation is to go to openglobalrights.org because there's a wealth of, of uh, case studies, uh, practical guides on, on hope-based communications, on, on, uh, on uh, creative narratives uh, written by some of my colleagues at OGR, but also by the activists themselves. So I'll just give you a couple of examples from uh, but this, this is kind of a, a, a very quick and dirty sample. I could use many other instances. So I already mentioned the use of humor. One uh, other way in which some humorous organizations are trying to counter uh, the repressive measures is by changing their organizational structures, right? The one thing that is beautiful about technology. Technology, of course, has its downside, but it is, these days it's more feasible to work in a decentralized way around the world, right? So authoritarian governments try to crack down on physically immobile organizations, say by making it difficult to receive funds from foreign democratic governments, or from foundations or from donors uh, or for individuals who want to support their work. Now, those authoritarian governments do not have jurisdiction over what happens elsewhere. So more and more, and, and I think that this trend is going to increase with the pandemic, uh, organizations are becoming what experts call decentralized or distri distributed organizations. This was pioneered just like Russia and the Russian government pioneered many of the anti-civil society measures. Russian activists pioneered some of these uh, countermeasures, which is to try to avoid those sections by operating more fluidly um, in different parts of the world, right? The, setting up offices elsewhere or working with individuals as opposed to organizations uh, to, through offices in, in other parts of the world. Now with the pandemic and everyone working remotely, I think that this is going to be uh, more and more common. And then a second example has to do with modes of, uh, of uh, funding. So this, the, my previous example was about modes of organization. This one uh, uh, is about funding. 
human rights organizations have been relatively vulnerable to restrictions to foreign funding because there used to be only a few funding uh, sources of funding in many countries, right? Mostly uh, foreign funders uh, in <clears throat> in, uh, in the global north. Many organizations are becoming more citizen-driven, more uh, volunteer-driven. So, for example, Amnesty International, the largest human rights organization, uh, over the last few months has been quite successful at increasing its membership around the world. And the members around the world contribute a small amount of money, it could be one dollar or less. Right? But if you have hundreds of thousands of those uh, members, you get two things at the same time. One is you actually mobilize the population because it's not about the money, uh, it's or just about the money. It is mostly about engaging, reaching out to the to a broader constituency. Uh, so becoming a, a movement organization as opposed to a kind of a brick and mortar uh, office um, based organization as it's also a way that human rights, some human rights entities have um, innovated in response to initially to illiberal democracy and more recently to COVID. So just like, just like um, anti-rights networks have become quite fluid and mobilized online, you know, rights defending organizations need to be more imaginative about their structures and their ways of operating. There is one remark about using humor, uh, but uh, I will tell you about it, but ask something else too. Uh, since these populist leaders claim anti-elitism, uh, doesn't using humor feed their rhetoric of anti-elitism, giving them grounds to say that these intellectuals only know how to make fun of real people? So this is a remark, but let me ask the question, uh, as other places in the world, civil society activities, as well as cultural and artistic activities, which address sociopolitic issues, which were already vulnerable, were impacted by the pandemic. Many of us anticipate that the government might take this as an advantage and continue its surveillance, limiting mechanisms over those activities. How can we tackle uh, with uh, this uh, pr uh, pr problem? Meaning what measures That's a great uh, for the pandemic, yeah. That's a great question and it's one that's hard to answer because it is true and I'm glad that someone raised this question because when I speak of civil society organizations, I'm not speaking only of human rights organizations by any means because as you all painfully know uh, autocrats tend to go after any dissident voice be them artists academics journalists and so on so the the instead of Answer, I would not have a good answer in terms of how to protect people who practice the arts uh, from the persecution. My only unhelpful answer is that they would probably, in the most repressive regimes, will be targeted anyway if they are, if they're being active or they're being participating, even in street protests. As we know, one of the most draconian measures, the type of measures that these governments take, is go after the uh, protesters on the street either uh, and the cause is really could be anything could be the defense of a park in the middle of a, of a city uh, or it could be uh, the defense of a piece of legislation that uh, the government is putting in place because um, it for example violates the rights of minorities as in india uh, recently so the way in which I have seen this being tackled creatively is again through fluid organizational forms. 
in ways in which it's not just the artists, it's not just the human rights lawyers, it's not just the journalists uh, taking all the heat, but you know, cross-cutting alliances of citizens, and I'm sure that you all have participated in, in many of these, that also cut across class. Because as, as Murat said, it's very easy for these leaders to call names and to accuse the opposition of being what in some places in Latin America are called caviar intellectuals, like the people who are talkers and are, do not suffer like the real people. Uh, but if those alliances are cross-class, which is, I think is starting to happen more clearly under COVID because the uh, labor movement and also movements of uh, oppressed racial and ethnic minorities are coming out more forcefully to the street and creating alliances across uh, classes, that that more diverse, more inclusive progressive firm will be harder to stigmatize and to counter by authoritarian leaders. Okay, let, let me ask a last question because we have exceeded an hour and uh, I, I don't want to take your time more than uh, that. Um, uh, since the measures taken uh, against the opposition and the people in general are similar, do you it's similar with all the autocratic leaders? Because when uh, Putin takes a, a new measure against civil society, uh, I personally fear a lot that these measures will be adapted here in Turkey too, and some of them have been. Uh, some of them are similar. Do you think that there is a guidebook for these authoritarian leaders about these measures? Mm -hmm. Well, there is, there may be a real guidebook, but, uh, but if there isn't, there certainly is a, a figurative uh, guidebook. And in the book that you mentioned, uh, we try to come up with a list of items that is usually included in those textbooks for authoritarians. And um, so I'll give you a quick example. So if you wanted, I once wrote an op-ed called a, a script for a new authoritarian or a guidebook for a new authoritarian, right? So this would be, and this would be the list, right? of recommendations for that authoritarian that they tend to give each other. And, and in a moment, I will explain that this is not just fiction. This something along these lines actually happens. But let me just for pedagogical purposes, come up with a simple list, a checklist of measures that any authoritarian like this one would be advised to take. First, make it very difficult to register any new NGOs or to run any existing NGO um, through administrative restrictions. Sometimes euphemistically called uh, um, accountability uh, measures or transparency measures. Second, make it very difficult for independent voices to get support from international funders and international governments. For example, by making that type of support the basis accusations of foreign espionage or complicity with foreign agents. Again, Russia partly invented that part of the textbook. It's been deployed elsewhere. Egypt, uh, Bolsonaro tried in the first uh, week of his government and so on. Third, use relentless us versus them narratives. So invest heavily in propaganda that is highly divisive and stigmatize anyone who opposes you as member of the other camp, as the them, and call them non-patriots, non-Indian, non-Turkish, non-Brazilians, and so on. Uh, fourth, do, uh, uh, try to uh, survive your first term in office and, the, and get reelected. And then after re-election, undermine the electoral rules of the game 
that got you elected because you will need to be re-elected again over and over and over again Russia and uh, and many other places look at Maduro how long he's been around and uh, and uh, so these are so the only way that they can live in this world is by perpetuating themselves not as a movement not even as a movement but as individuals yeah. so that sooner or later they will become undemocratic so they may begin as illiberal democrats but they will, as you know, as the law of gravity, will have to become full-blown authoritarians because they will break the rules of the electoral game to get reelected. And finally, and this list is longer, but I just give you a, a quick taste of it. At the international level, come together with similarly minded and situated governments. So it, just as it is crucial for human rights organizations and, and, and journalists, uh, independent journalistic outlets in different regions and countries to come together in defense of democracy, in defense of freedom of expression and so on, they, the authoritarians of the world have established an informal club. So just give you an example so that uh, this has some sociological bite to it. If you look at the lineup of presidents who attended the inauguration of President Bolsonaro uh, in Brazil a couple of years ago, you would have found Viktor Orban or um, Netanyahu, but people who no one in the general populace, uh, population of Brazil would have recognized from the face. It wasn't, uh, you know, if Trump would have shown up, well, they would have recognized him. But it was these people from Hungary, from Israel, showing up. And what were they doing there? Showing solidarity and making sure that a new powerful member of the club would be welcome. And informally or formally, there is advice going on. Uh, there is cooperation going on. And uh, of course, as we know, sadly, for example, the government of Venezuela manages to stay afloat barely through the support of authoritarian governments from China to Russia. And, uh, and so this cross-learning and mutual support is crucial to uh, that structure. And that's what also it has allowed it to survive for longer than any of us would have hoped. Cesar, uh, it has been a great pleasure meeting with you again, even it's uh, uh, online, and I, I would like to thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience on, on these issues. Thank you very much. Ve Türkiye'de katılanlara da katılıp dinlediğiniz ve soru yönelttiğiniz için çok teşekkür ederim. Bir sonraki panelde görüşmek üzere. I hope we'll meet again. Uh, in the next panels uh, uh, in the near future. Bye-bye.